I'd like to welcome you this evening to this public lecture at the Institute for Computational and Experimental Research in Mathematics. ICERM is a National Science Foundation funded institute at Brown University. Major support for this institute also comes from Brown University. I am Jill Pfeiffer, the director of ICERM, and it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our distinguished speaker, Andrea Bertazzi. Professor Bertazzi holds the Betsy Wood Knapp Chair for Innovation and Creativity at UCLA, where she is also the Director of Applied Mathematics. Professor Bertazzi received her PhD in mathematics at Princeton University in 1991, and she has held positions at the University of Chicago, Argonne National Laboratory, and Duke University. She currently serves as the chair of our Science Advisory Board here at ICERM, as well as serving on boards of other major research institutes. Professor Bertazzi has done groundbreaking work in a number of fields, including partial differential equations, fluid dynamics, image processing, and also social science applications of mathematics, one, of t one topic in which you're going to hear tonight. Among her many honors and awards, too many to name, are the fact that she is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society and a fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics and was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2010. Please join me in welcoming Andrea Bertazzi. Thank you. Now I feel I really have to live up to that introduction. Thank you, Joel, for the lovely introduction. Can people hear me, especially in the back? Okay, very good. Okay, thank you. So, um, so I have the pleasure today of, of having an opportunity to share with you uh, sort of a body of work that we've done at UCLA related to crime. And this has been, um, I think, one of the most exciting areas of research in my career. And um, the excitement really, I think, is, is at the level of the fact that we can have an imp direct impact on society. Um, you know, we've, we started as a, as a small group. Um, in fact, um, it, it was recently pointed out to me that um, our sort of our twin, uh, not twin, but our, our companion um, NSF Institute at UCLA, the, our, the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics, um, kind of inspired this this, uh, this work. Um, it began with a collaboration with my colleague Jeff Brantingham in anthropology, uh, who um, came to me one day asking if I would collaborate with him on crime research. And up until that point, I had only worked on physical science modeling, working with scientists in the laboratory. I had never worked on you know, human activity kind of problems. And I was a little skeptical, I have to be honest with you. you know, working with a social scientist, I was a little concerned that they might not be that precise. So I looked at him and I said, and for those of you in, the, in law enforcement, I think well, if, you, if you know a little bit about the history of law enforcement in Los Angeles and, and Chief Bratton and how he was promoting data science, this was about eight years ago, so he was there at the time. Um, you know, and I, I didn't know all of what they were doing, so I kind of looked you know, sort of over my glasses at Jeff and I said, you know, tell me about what kind of data you have. Because I had been working with physical scientists who generated very high quality data, and he said, well, for example, we have all the recorded automobile thefts in the city of Los Angeles last year, 48,000. We have make, model, and year of the car. We have the GIS location of where the car was stolen from and when, and if it was found, also the GIS location of where it was found. And I thought, okay, that's data. <laughs> that is data. So, that conversation began what was a very fruitful collaboration to where we are today. Um, and uh, you may be wondering, what is this picture I'm, I have flashing up here? That's actually a fake simulation of residential burglaries in the San Fernando Valley um, in Los Angeles using one of our models. Um, this is an example of the kinds of things we can do. And one of the things we have to do in order to be able to test algorithms and models is we have to be able, we have to not only be able to look at real world data, but we have to be able to simulate fake data. Why do we do that? Because when you have fake data, you have complete ground truth of what's going 
going on, right? And then, and then you can use um, the fake data to try to test you know, algorithms and models. So that's just one example of one of the things we do. So this is a fake simulation of crime. Um, so going forward about eight years, here we are today, and sort of miraculously coming out directly from our research at UCLA is a piece of software called Prenpol, um, which stands for predictive policing. It's actually a commercial software company now. Um, that was put together by Jeff Brantingham and one of our, the former postdocs from our group, George Muller. Um, Predpol is now running in um, over 30 cities worldwide, including some big cities that you all know, like Seattle and Atlanta, and of course, Los Angeles. Um, and this was very exciting for us to be able to be directly involved with this, with this work. Um, and so what I wanted to do was, I have a little video from, um, put together by NBC. One of the fun things about living in LA is, there, you know, we, we were there with the entertainment industry, so it's very, if somebody wants to make a video about your work, um, you know, everyone is right there. The, the entire industry is right there. So I have a little, um, I have a little video, it's just a few minutes, that I wanted to share with you um, about this particular piece. A major witch form one of the losing fights of Wayne Tuesday for public accounts dangerous violence. Los Angeles, California, second most populous city in the United States, spread out over 468 square miles. With nearly 4 million residents and fewer than 10,000 police officers sworn to protect and serve, keeping order is a full-time job. We are playing probabilities um, and putting officers in the right place at the right time. To make the most of their resources, police captains like Sean Malinowski of the LAPD and other police departments across the country are turning to a new tactic to help stop crime before it happens. It's called predictive policing. It calculates for the next 12 hours in the future. What areas have the highest probability of crime occurring? And then what we do is we provide that information to the officer, and then the officers go out and they try to prevent those crimes from occurring. The predictive policing program used by the LAPD didn't come out of a police academy. It's based on research by a team of mathematicians and social scientists at UCLA, trying to predict where and when crime is most likely to happen. I have these ideas that really human behavior is actually really quite predictable and that you can uh, study human behavior and understand where crime patterns come from in a very quantitative way. With funding from the National Science Foundation, anthropology professor Jeff Brantingham teamed up with mathematics professor Amir Bertozzi and others to analyze crime patterns and develop computer models to simulate criminal behavior. Their crime prediction model is based on the same algorithms used to predict earthquakes and aftershocks. Once an event happens, it triggers another event. And so you can apply this idea to gang crimes, you can apply it to burglaries, you can apply it to automobile theft. There are many types of activities for which this idea is very relevant. Thousands of pieces of crime data from the LAPD, including locations, times, and dates of past crimes, are processed by the software program known as Fredpool to calculate and predict potential criminal activity for an area at a certain time. And those predictions are delivered back to the police departments in a way that allows them to use it in a real-time fashion. At roll call in the Foothill area of Los Angeles, where UCLA tested the program in 2011. So today we're going to hand out the predictive policing maps. Officers received maps showing the areas of predicted activity for the next shift. Red boxes on the map highlight the hotspots areas measuring 500 feet by 500 feet that will require extra patrols. So the officers know that's the highest probability area where they should be looking for a crime to be committed. And we ask them to get in there and disrupt the crime from occurring or deny the criminal the opportunity to commit the crime. That's just what happened in 2011. This not Cruz, California, where officers were patrolling a hotspot, putting them in the right place at the right time to stop an assault. We came here, uh, did extra patrols, and stopped the crime. We will stop a crime in progress. Four dollars. We are helping police fight crime by giving them the best state-of-the-art mathematical models and algorithms to take the data from yesterday and today and figure out what's going to happen tomorrow. 
With mathematics and social sciences, police have a new weapon in their arsenal, helping not only to protect and serve, but also to predict a crime before it happens. <laughs> Okay, that was fun. All right, so we, and we have the NSF also to thank for that video. I think they provided funding for that. Okay, so that was the fun part of the talk. Um, now, I, so I have to, so we're gonna get into more of the details um, of the math, but I'm gonna try to keep it at a, at a very high level um, without getting into a lot of technical jargon. So I wanna give you the, I wanna give you sort of, um, we're gonna go through some case studies of some different problems that we've looked at, and I wanna give you kind of a, an overview of how mathematicians think about these problems and how we solve them and kind of the power of what we can do. So the, the, those of you, there are a few mathematicians in the audience, so you, you're welcome to try to go a little deeper into the math, but I'm gonna try, you may see an equation, but I'm gonna try to give you sort of a paint a high level picture, sort of functional picture about what it's trying to do. Okay, so that, but this story I think was really, really, um, incredible because um, we, you know, this is, I think this is a, a real success for mathematics. You know, you, there are lots of examples of technology that's funded by NSF or one of the other government agencies, basic research eventually leading to some major societal impact. And one of the examples that I like to point out that everyone loves to point out is the internet, right? So when I was, I don't know, 13 years old and I have to do the math here, in, late, in the late 1970s, let's not get into how late, right, or how early. But when I was 13 years old, I somehow managed to get an account on what was called the ARPANET, right? Which, is a, which was a Department of Defense network of a few computers in the United States um, that were you know, hooked, linked together by these high-speed connections. And, um, and then in, let's see, in around 1991 or two or three, in the early 90s, um, this, this, this internet started becoming commercial. So we're looking at a time scale of about 15 years you know, from when, uh, when, from how I remember, you know, my experience with the ARPANET as a kid, um, to the this this um, network becoming a, a big commercial enterprise. Um, in our case, we somehow got very lucky because in 2011, um, our group published a paper in the Journal of the American Statistical Association, and <laughs> in that same year, almost by chance, um, Santa Cruz, so in fact, Santa Cruz PD contacted my colleague, George Moeller, and said, you know, we read about your idea. And at, the po at that point in time, it was literally a, an academic research paper, right? He, so if you have this assortment of locations and times of crimes in the past you know, um, few weeks, here is a model that's based on these earthquake and aftershock models. Here's a model that you can use to possibly do a better job at predicting future crimes than other people have done. So we, this, this work was published in an academic journal. And in June, um, Santa Cruz PD, they wanted to try it out. They called up George and they said, you know, do you have something we can try? And he wasn't even thinking about doing this, but he thought, what the heck, I, this wouldn't be so hard for me to give them a little program that would generate information for them to use in the field. And at the time, Sam, to be fair, Santa Cruz was not doing anything sophisticated with data. Um, so they went from essentially nothing to the software program. Um, and that month had a 27% reduction in crime, which was really incredible. Um, what was even more incredible was NBC was on a ride along, okay, when they were actually using, you know, the, these boxes and going to locations. And you saw the, the, the filming, right? They actually taped this uh, disruption of a crime in progress. So, so that was kind of fortuitous for us, not only because it worked, but also because we were getting some press for that. Um, uh, that led to a November, 2011 pilot study in Los Angeles, and this was a controlled study in the Foothill Division. So at the time, Los Angeles was already doing a lot with data. So at the time, uh, LA was doing hotspot policing, and they had, uh, they had a lot of implementation of data analysis. They had people in the different divisions who were assigned as analysts to look at recent crimes and give the people on patrol some ideas about where they should be looking for future crimes based on 
on past information. And so what our pilot study did was it actually took the analyst and the computer program and had them go head to head, you know, in a double blind study. So, um, and so what happened was the analyst would generate a list of place areas to look at, the computer program would generate a list, um, and different patrols were given one of the two lists, and they were not told which list they were given, and they looked identical, so they were packaged the same way. Um, and at the end of that, month, um, what they discovered was that the computer program um, did, did measurably better than the analyst, but, but certainly not at this level, right? It wasn't a 27% difference, but it was a measurable difference. So, um, so that kind of started, uh, you know, the, the uh, sort of mass production of this, this software package so that it could be used not only in a couple of cities, but basically any city that wanted it. Um, so in order to do that, you can't, like, we're not going to quit our jobs and do this for free, right? You have to, you have to, you know, somebody has to, uh, you have to hire people, um, the servers have to be kept in a secure location. Um, so, th so there's a lot that goes into this, but basically a startup company was formed called Predpol, um, and now they're, the software is being used in quite a number of cities and apparently very successfully. So we're happy about that. Um, so now what I want to do, so you might think, oh wow, I can, I, I'm a mathematician, I can pick a problem like this and, and two years from now, you know, I'm going to have a software package. Well, it might happen, but um, I wanted to give you an idea of sort of the, all the things that happened leading up to this and at the same time give you kind of some vignettes of different types of problems and different types of mathematics that are relevant to, um, to crime. So, uh, and I want to keep in mind that because this, this was a very important collaboration with Jeff and with social scientists, you know, there are many ways mathematics can be used to help um, people um, in law enforcement. And, there, and we're not looking at all of those ways. So for example, we're not coming up with better methods for fingerprint analysis. I mean, that's an interesting image processing problem, but that's not part of this research. Rather, what we're doing is we're looking at how humans behave in a collective setting, and can we somehow quantify those behaviors in a way that we can you know, directly answer um, problems that are of interest to the police and what I should now you might you might worry that I uh, that I gave you this example where we had an analyst and a computer and you might think that poor analyst is out of the job and actually no our, our goal was not to replace the analyst but rather to give them a tool right so the point we're not trying to tell police this is you know we know everything and you know not now that's of course we don't know everything at all but but um, there are things that we can do that we think would be helpful as a tool um, because because urban crime is, uh, is complex, but on the other hand, there are quite a lot of, of sort of repeating patterns in the crime, and if you can model those in a sort of low dimensional um, way that you can get your hands around, sometimes you can provide information that's not so transparent, just looking at the data un unassisted. So that's, that's the idea. So our goals were actually fairly modest. And you know, this video makes it sound like you know, we gave them the answer and they found the crime. And, and, and in reality, what's happening is something that's much more mundane, okay? So these guys are out on patrol every day, and most of the time they're answering calls for service. So they're not looking at our maps, you know? What they're doing is they're, uh, they get a call, oh, you need to go here, you know, there's something going on, you need to go to this location. So most of the time they're answering calls for service, it has nothing to do with our software. But there are other times when they're not answering calls for service and they're doing a routine patrol of their assigned area. And during those times, what we're trying to give them is a tool that might indicate um, the areas that are more likely to have something interesting happening. Um, and so that's the point, is really to, to help um, optimize uh, you know, the, the job of these people in the field. That's really what we're trying to do. Okay, so um, I also should say that this project has involved a lot of people. Um, this is a par actually only a partial list, but it gives you an idea of the breadth of, of uh, science that's going into this. So um, it started with my colleague Jeff Brantingham in anthropology and another colleague of mine, Lincoln Chase, who's a statistical physicist. But then many other people have been involved, like George Tita, who's a criminologist at UC Irvine. He's a gang expert. And in Los Angeles, there are parts of the city where it's very important to have you know, some connection to the gang crimes because that's most of what's going on in, in certain parts of the city. Um, Stan Osher, who is an expert 
in image processing and compressed sensing. Um, Rick Schoenberg, who's an expert in statistics, and he's the one who was really the guiding force in the initial work that we did on uh, the point process model, which led to the predictive policing algorithm. Um, many postdocs have been involved, a lot of whom are now um, either at tenure track jobs or working in industry. Um, quite a lot of graduate, I think we're up to something like nine PhD theses now coming out of this. Um, and the number of undergraduates has been really the, the most amazing thing about this program. We've had well over 50 undergraduates involved in research on crime modeling. Um, and this, you know, with the, with the vast amount of data coming out of Los Angeles and other cities and the large diversity of problems that they're interested in, this has just generated just a huge amount of quantitative problems, a lot of which are quite accessible for younger students. So this has been really fun for them as well. Um, so another thing I should mention, for those of you in academia and working with undergraduates, we do have an undergraduate summer program um, where we do have crime modeling projects. And in fact, there are two programs, one at our institute, IPAM, and another one um, in my department at UCLA. Um, and both of these programs involve undergraduates. So if, if you know of students who might be interested in this, um, you can have them email me and I'd be happy to, to answer their questions. Okay, so you cannot do work in this area without direct involvement of law enforcement because they're the ones with the problems and the data. And most of our work has been with LAPD and our main point of contact there is Sean Malinowski. He actually has a PhD and this was very helpful for us, especially I think um, in the early stages of the work, not necessarily because he was using his research background, but that he appreciated it and I think that he, because he had these letters after his name, um, it gave him a little bit of credibility within the Los Angeles Police Department because you know, he had to get permission to let us use data and let us work on problems. Um, also, uh, Zach Friend, who was at the time with Santa Cruz PD, um, he was very, he was instrumental in getting us working directly with them on predictive policing. And we've also done some earlier work with Long Beach PD. So those are the three primary um, local law enforcement agencies that we worked with. Okay, so now we're going to look at some actual real world problems. And the first problem I'm going to show you is an example that is a different class of models from the one that led to the PredPol software, but it gives you an idea of the power of mathematics for very complex systems like social systems with crime. Okay, so this is a, a toy model, and it's kind of fun. And, uh, but but it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna show you um, how a very simple model can lead to some pretty complex dynamics, but nevertheless dynamics that we can completely pull apart with, uh, with some mathematics. So in my toy model, I have a, a city, and this is a residential part of the city, so I have a bunch of houses, and, and on the west coast, a lot of our streets are on grids, maybe not as much here on the east coast, but in LA, it's very common to have a gridded structure for your neighborhood, so my houses are on a grid, and each house has an attractiveness value, okay? So what is that? The attractiveness is not a good thing. It's actually how likely is that, it measures how likely the house is to be broken into. Right? So if I have a higher attractiveness number at my house, I don't want that. Because that means that burglars will be attracted to my house. Okay, so, um, so this, in this little toy, I've got, um, so this house is very attractive. It has, notice that it's a sum of two numbers, a blue one and a red one, and the blue one doesn't change. The blue one has to do with the local neighborhood, how densely populated it is, who lives there, what's nearby, things that don't change very, very quickly. The red number is gonna change. Okay, so I want, you, I want you to keep your eye on the red numbers. Okay, so now we have a couple burglars and they are going to make decisions about where to move in this neighborhood. So, so they're kind of burglars looking for crimes of opportunity, but at the same time they have some idea of how attractive these houses are. So they're gonna move um, to more, they're gonna sort of move in a random way, but to on average towards more attractive houses. So this burglar goes from a lower attractive house to a more attractive house. This one is already at a very attractive house, so this one stays. Then they're gonna make a decision about whether they're gonna break into the house. So, so the, first, the first point is movement, the second step is, is break in or no break-in, and that is gonna be a probabilistic 
um, problem. So with some probability, each burglar will break into the house, and the probability is a function of this attractiveness. So the more attractive, the more likely the house will get broken into. So this house just got broken into. This one did not. And, uh, and then once the house gets broken into, the burglar takes the loot um, and goes home with the loot. So this doesn't sound like a very nice city because no one's getting caught, right? But let's just see what happens. So now something, something interesting happens. I want you to watch those red numbers. So this house that's just broken, just got broken into, that red number goes from 12 to 16. So it goes up even higher. So suddenly that house that just got broken into becomes much more attractive. And, but something else happens. The next door neighbor houses also increase, okay? But the other houses don't, okay? So that happens on a very quick time scale, like the next day or so. And then over a longer time scale, all of these red numbers slowly decay. Okay, so, so you might wonder what's responsible for these numbers changing? Well, if I'm the burglar who broke into the house successfully and I snatch and grab something and run, while I'm snatching and grabbing, I see something else over there. And I might not be able to carry that thing, but I know it's there. And I know if I come back in a couple days, that thing may still be there and I can get that, right? So that's an obvious reason. But another reason might be that when I broke in, I actually broke a window to get into the house. And that window is still broken, and the, the window doesn't get fixed overnight, right? So I'm not the same burglar, I'm some other burglar, and I'm walking down the street, and I see that broken window, and I think, hmm, that looks like a target. Let's go check out that house. Okay, but maybe I'm walking by that house, and I see the next door neighbor house. And that looks interesting, too. And so that might be why the houses next door get broken. Or maybe I tell my friend, maybe I say, you know, I just, I just went into that house and you know, they had like, you know, I got a cell phone, I got, you know, a DVD player, or whatever, I got all this stuff and, and you know, I think I saw the same kind of stuff through the window of the house next door, right? So the friend goes over there and gets the stuff out of the house next door. So there's lots and lots of reasons why these numbers would go up. And for our model, we don't care about the individual reason. We care that it happens and that we can measure them. Okay, so if you actually go and study field data from Los Angeles, all of these numbers you can measure in the field data. The rate at which the attractiveness goes up, the rate at which the attractiveness decays, and how far away do you have to go where you still see an effect with the neighboring houses. All of that is data that's in, it's, if you look at the, the residential burglary data from Los Angeles, you can pull out all of those numbers. What you can't pull out from the data is the decisions that the criminals are making, right? Those, why? Because, well, we're not putting radio collars on, on the burglars or ankle bracelets. Maybe we do after they're caught, but before they're caught, we are not tracking them. So we have no idea. We have to make that part of the model up. So what I just showed you was a very simplistic model where about half of the model we can actually measure empirically in the field and the other half of the model, so the empirical measurements are the status of the houses that we can measure. And this is, by the way, this is assuming that I'm not including unreported crimes. So let's, let's say we live in, a, this is not reality, but let's say we live in a world where all the crimes are reported. Or if the crime isn't reported, we declare it not a crime, right? So, so let's assume that I know everything, perfect information about what's, what houses are being broken into when. And what I claim is that if you take a, a fairly, I mean, Los Angeles is a wonderful place to study this. Why? Because you have very organized, gridded streets, you have very large spatial area coverage with a fairly high population density and an awful lot of people. So it is a beautiful place to study this, right? It's like a perfect field, field experiment. So it turns out about half of this model we can actually measure empirically on, in a statistically average sense, right? So there's always, there's always a lot of randomness. But, but what's interesting about, so even though we can't measure the burglar's movement exactly, what's interesting about this model is if I take this model and I run it on a big computer with lots of agents, lots of criminals and lots of houses over a big area, just like we have in Los Angeles, this is what I get. And I'm showing you three different simulations with 
three different, I have different parameters in the model, so I, we kind of pick different ranges of parameters and we run simulations, and these are the three different kinds of behaviors that we get. So what is, this is very interesting because we're seeing hot spots forming. This is the attractiveness. So we're seeing fairly large geographic areas where suddenly the crime goes way up, okay? And it doesn't change. So we have formation of hot, and that is not a surprise because what we saw was in that model, the crime feeds on itself. It increases the attractiveness, which drives more crimes to certain areas. And we see that this happens almost automatically in the agent-based model. Um, but there are parameter ranges where we don't get that, and there are parameter ranges where we have hot spots, but they move around kind of on a slow time scale, right? So you see all three behaviors. And you might think that, oh wow, you know, the mathematicians can come up with a model, it, it's gonna look like reality, they can put it on a computer, and all they have to do is run the simulation to see what's gonna happen in real life. And so, my answer to you is actually that's not true, because we actually don't know, about half of the model is fiction, because we don't know exactly how the criminals are making decisions. So that's one of, one of the problems. Um, but the flip side about it is that we can actually, if we actually knew the other half of the model, Precisely, we could do a whole lot more than just running numerical simulations. We can actually predict analytically when you're gonna get these two scenarios. In other words, you could give me a set of parameters for my model, and without running the simulation, closing my eyes, I could tell you which case you're gonna get. And I'm gonna give you a rough idea about how you do that. Okay, and so this is where, this is sort of the power of mathematics, and those of you who aren't mathematicians, you know, just give me a few minutes and I'll get to more cool stuff, okay? So this is where the technical stuff comes in. And so what it does, well the technical stuff is called mean field, a mean field theory for this stochastic model, and it involves nonlinear differential equations. And I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I'll just say that you have an equation for the attractiveness in space and time, and you have an equation for, now this is a density of burglars, continuum density of burglars in space and time. So it only makes sense if you have a pretty big city with a lot of burglars. One burglar, it's not gonna make sense. So this is, right, so this is for, this is for LA, right, this isn't, Oh, this isn't for pick your favorite small city that only has a population of 3,000, right? This is, this is Los Angeles. Okay, so you, so, the, so you don't stop here. So it turns out once, you, once we do this, we have a lot of theory for how to solve these equations, including very basic analysis. When I say basic, it's at the level of advanced undergraduate or beginning graduate level mathematics, right, that level. So it's not for, not like freshman calculus, but like advanced undergraduate uh, math majors or beginning graduate students called linear stability analysis, you can actually write down analytically the formula for the transition in our mean field model for the case where you don't have hot spots to the case where you do. We can actually come up with an exact um, formula, and so, so if you give me a set of parameters, I can tell you whether you're gonna see this or this. Um, I can write down a formula for that. So we like that, but there's more. So another thing we can do, and this is really fun, because this gets into mathematics at the level of advanced graduate students. So here's our, here's our hotspot model. This is the, the agent-based model. And now I have police. And I'm sorry, policemen who are real policemen. Um, we have dots for you in this model. <laughs> but they're just showing the location of where we're gonna put the police. And so the take-home message here is that my hotspots form. Let's, let's see, if, let's start this again. So I form the hotspots, and then I send the police to go live on top of the hotspots. So they're coming, and here they're coming almost. Where are they? Here they, there they are. So what happens is immediately after the police show up, not a good thing. The hotspots reform in other locations, right? So in this little mo toy model, the hotspots have been displaced, right? So you have this neighborhood, there's a lot of drug dealing going on, a lot of, a lot of drug related crimes. You suddenly put a big police presence there and it's now a mile down the street, right? That's not, that's not what you wanna hear. That's a waste of resources, right? All right, here's another example. I have one hotspot, and so this is an easier problem for the police, but it's the same model. I haven't changed anything other than parameters. So the police come into the one hotspot, the hotspot goes away. Oh, there's no new hotspot. 
So in this case, we've actually suppressed the hotspot. And you might say, well, it's a different model. No, it's the same model. I just changed my parameters. How can you do that? Well, it turns out that this is a feature, if you will, of nonlinear, of complex nonlinear dynamical systems. So this is an example of a, of a class of models that has what we call a bifurcation. So it's a fancy mathematical term, but it's something that we can actually quantify and we can measure. And this turns out to have a pitchfork bifurcation. And this is, in, this is an example on the subcritical side and this is an example on the supercritical side. Um, and we can actually quantitatively measure this, th these two types of behaviors as well. Um, but it involves a lot more sophisticated mathematics, kind of at the level of a PhD student or postdoc. In fact, Martin Short, this is not the actor, by the way. Okay. Oh, he is an actor. He's in another movie, but it's one of our UCLA movies, right? <laughs> We, we had a, we had a fake we had a, a we made a movie one year called Disaster Los Angeles, which wasn't about crime; it was about terrorist attacks. And Martin um, was the scientist who saved us from the terrorists in the movie, right? So, but he's not he's not the the actor the well known actor Martin Sherr. But anyway, Martin, who was a postdoc with us, so he had a PhD. He actually did these calculations um, to show analytically how to predict whether you could suppress the crime or whether you could merely displace the crime. And that was published about four years ago in Proceedings of the National. This is a very, this isn't, by the way, nothing, none of this has been implemented in the field. This is just an academic paper, um, one in PNAS and one in SIADS. Okay, so I like this example. This is another sort of vignette. My student, Laura Smith, this was part of her PhD thesis. And she was interested in how groups of people form, naturally form territories in the city. And she was, in, she was very interested in street gangs because as you know, they form geographic territories and they're rather territorial about their area, right? And so, um, so we were interested in whether models that already existed in the literature could be adapted to understand and model, quantitatively model this. And so it turns out this beautiful study came out in 2006 in Yellowstone, but there's no gangs in Yellowstone. Well, there are gangs in Yellowstone, but they're animals, right? They're animal gangs, right? So it turns out that there are big packs of coyotes in Yellowstone, and they've been well studied. And so, uh, and this is, a this is a beautiful paper, the Yellowstone paper. And so Laura decided to see if she could adapt that, that class of models to study the street gangs in Los Angeles. And she, she was successful, but I'm gonna explain to you some of the, some of the challenges that we, run, that we run into when we're trying to do this kind of modeling for street gangs versus coyotes. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's do a comparison here. So we have an ecological model looking at packs of coyotes. Um, and so we're gonna somehow associate these packs to the street gangs in LA. So each coyote is gonna be a gang, is gonna be like a gang member. Um, and then the entire pack is gonna be like a gang. Um, and now the question is, how do they mark their territory, right? So any of, so those of you who, uh, who own um, male dogs know how they mark their territory, if you've ever walked one. And I have one, Barkley, at home. So, um, so they, they use what are, what the, so the, the technical term in biology is scent markings. But you know what that is, right? We don't have to explain what scent markings are, right? <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> So, so that's how the coyotes mark their territory, and, it, and it's very effective, it really works. Um, they don't use the same method, the gangs. <laughs> they don't. Um, they, a lot of, so a lot of what they do involves visual markings, right, with like spray paint, tagging. Um, but it's the same kind of idea. They're, they're putting some kind of marking as to where their territory is and distinguishing that from other territories. So, all right, so, so this may seem kind of fun and silly, but actually what we really wanna do is a quantitative analysis of what's going on. So we don't, this isn't really, this is not a silly problem, this is a real problem. So I wanna show you a picture of what was done in Yellowstone, okay? And so what the, what the scientists did for Yellowstone was they, they wanted a model that was sort of analogous to that mean field model I showed you for the burglaries. And why do we like mean field models? Because we can use them for prediction. Um, we don't want to have to change parameters slightly and then just run yet another simulation on the computer. We want to actually be able to analyze the model and get something, something um, you know, more definitive out of it. So in this example, what they're trying to do is invent 
a continuum mean field model for the behavior and the, and the regions of where these five coyote packs should be occupying in Yellowstone. So we have one, two, three, four, five packs. And I just want to explain the figure to you. I want to explain this picture. What are you looking at? So um, you guys see the black stripes here on the map? These are, well, you can sort of guess what these are. These are, this is a contour map, and these are elevation levels. Right, so anyone who's done mountaineering or hiking with an elevation map has seen this kind of map, right? And if you haven't, you, can, you get the idea. So one, if you follow one of these lines, all the points on the line correspond to an area that's exactly the same height above sea level. And so where you see a whole bunch of lines together like this, that means it's a steep hill, okay? That's what it means. Um, and then there are other lines here. So in, the colored lines have nothing to do with elevation. Well, they, they do sort of indirectly, but they're not about elevation at all. So the colored lines have to do with the density of the population of a particular pack. So I have a light blue pack here, and these colored lines are giving me information about how densely populated is that particular pack in, you know, in the area here. So you can see that these, co these colored lines are showing very well separated regions for the five packs. Now there are dots, there are colored dots as well. Those colored dots are the field data. So what do they do? They, they catch coyotes from each of the five packs and they put a radio collar with a GPS tracker on the animal. They let it go back into the pack. And we hope that the coyote is not thinking, you know, they're tracking me now, so I'm gonna do something different. You know, we're just hoping, right? Because you know, if it's a criminal, because well, you see where I'm going with this, right? Right? You know the criminal's gonna behave differently. So we're hoping the coyote is just like, yeah, whatever, I got a collar on, no big deal, right? So, um, and so, so they were, they're able to track the coyotes, and so we can compare the mathematical fiction with the actual field reality um, and see how close they are. And you can see, I think they're pretty good, at least as far as this. Now you might wonder, what is this model about? Well, this model is all about the dynamics of the packs and how they use scent markings to define their territory and how they respond to the scent markings of other other animals. That's what it's all about. So we took a, a shot in the dark guess that maybe the same sort of thing happens with street gangs in Los Angeles. So here's Los Angeles. Now this is a small part of Los Angeles. This is the Hollenbeck division of LAPD. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the geography of Los Angeles. I know you live there, right? You grew up there. So I'm at UCLA, which is on the west side. If I want to go to Hollenbeck, I'm probably driving in my, with no traffic at all, which is like never, right? It's probably like a 30, 40, maybe a 40 minute drive to Hollenbeck. This is east of downtown. And UCLA is about 20 minutes from the Pacific Ocean, west of downtown. And LA is huge. Right? I mean, this is like, it's like the state of Rhode Island kind of, well, not that big. That, not that big, but you know, sort of like, you know, we're talking closer to that scale than the size of the city of Providence, right? It's closer to that scale. So it's big, right? So this is a small, I mean, on the side, you know, according to the whole hall of Los Angeles, this is a relatively small area, but it happens to be home to not 10, not 20, but 30 street gangs. So we're talking about a relatively small area with 30 street gangs, and geographically also very diverse. You've got the Los Angeles River in blue here on the, on the side, and you guys have seen that in TV if you haven't seen it in person. It's a con big concrete river, and you might think, why the heck does LA have a concrete river? Well, read the history about what happened to Los Angeles before the concrete river. It was not pretty, mainly because of flooding issues, right? So the concrete river actually has a very important, a very important um, job, but it also gives us a very marked geographic boundary um, in the city. So that's one boundary of Hollenbeck. And these red lines are freeways, right? So there's the 10 freeways cutting right through Hollenbeck. Um, so anyway, this is Hollenbeck. And this is kind of an anecdotal map of the territories of all of the 30 street gangs in Hollenbeck. And I think this was from George Tita's book about 10 years ago. So it's, it's historical data from LA. So what did, Laura, what did my student Laura do? What she did was she said, okay, I want to see if I can take my model for how these gangs should behave and how the population should move around this area of Hollenbeck 
you know, using the same kind of paradigm as the one that was used here, only I have to simulate so just like they did here, she needs to simulate both the movement of the populations, but also the locations of the markings, because that was really critical in defining the territory, right? And she's got to somehow get the analog of the role of the geography, right? So we don't have a mountainous terrain, but we do have the LA River. We have freeways. We have different street densities. So all of that information had to be encoded in great detail in the simulation. And she needed, um, she needed a partial differential equation for each of the street gangs. There are 30 of them. And she needed one for each of the locations of the, uh, for the locations of each of the different markings. So whereas this paper involved simultaneously solving 10 coupled partial differential equations, this paper involved simultaneously solving 60 couple differential equations. So this was done on a supercomputer at, at UCLA. So this, is, this was not an easy calculation. This is not something you just go down and you program and the next day it's running. This took like months of work. And, and only because it was Laura, if it was any other student, it would have been years of work rather than months. Um, but she's a machine with this kind of stuff. And so out pops a density distribution of all the, all the 30 street gangs and a density distribution of all of the gang tags. And so now we get to comparing with reality, right? Just like they did in Yellowstone. Okay, so the problem is we have no reality to compare with. We certainly don't keep tr put radio collars on our criminals, right? I mean, you guys would probably love that, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, and we would too. But, but, but of course, if we did that, this would all go away, right? They would, they, everything would change because they know you're measuring them. So, um, and, we, and guess what? We, this information in theory we could get. I mean, this is public information. You could go out in the street and take pictures of the gang tags, right? But that's, and in fact, somebody might do that, but not the police. The city of Los Angeles is responsible for cleaning up the graffiti, right? And the police deals with the crime. So this is, so I just want to, you know, from a policy standpoint, I want to give you a picture of what we as mathematicians sort of are up against when we have to compare with field data. Because some of the data is the responsibility of a different government organization, and they might not actually, they're not, so the city of Los Angeles is not collecting information about gang tags like the police are collecting information about crime. We have beautiful, beautiful data about crime, but essentially no data about sort of the adjunct information that we think is very relevant to crime. So we have to make do with what we have. What we do have is violence in that area. So we made sort of a leap of faith and said, let's see if Laura's prediction for where the gang tags are located somehow correlates with the violence. And it does. So, so the, this is a very rough calculation. But basically what we're doing is looking at different threshold levels of Laura's estimate of where the gang tag should be. And we're seeing, if, as you increase the threshold level, are you picking up a lot of the, the locations of the violent crime in the same neighborhood during the same time? And, and indeed you are. So with, with this thresh, so for example, with this threshold level, we're flagging about 22% of this area, but we're picking up about 71% of all the violent crime locations. So it's a very, very loose correlation, um, but it was the only thing we could do, given the data we had. Um, it also points to, I think, at least from a scientific standpoint, it would be very interesting for us to be able to get, well, we know we can't do the radio collars, but one thing we can do is get those gang tag pieces of data. Well, not today, but maybe in the future. So if I were if I were a social scientist going to get money to measure, go out and measure something, this would be something that could be measured very easily. And think back to Yellowstone, right? What they don't have in the Yellowstone picture, they do not have dots for the scent markings, right? That would be really hard data to get. I mean, do you want to go sniffing trees in Yellowstone? I don't, and even if you could do that, could you figure out what the smell was? I don't think so, right? So, 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 what we, so what we see is that what's possible to measure in the ecological problem turns out to be sort of the opposite thing that we can measure for the analog problem of uh, gang crime. All right, 
So, perfect. So, I'm gonna, so now, I wanna do, well, now what I want to do is I want to move on to a different class of mathematical models. Um, and this is a class of models that led to our predictive policing method that's actually used in the field. But I want to introduce it to you in a different setting because you've already heard about the predictive policing setting. So I want to introduce it to you in the setting of gang rivalries. Because um, when you're looking at, say, so one of, the, one of the issues with Hollenbeck is that you have a lot of unsolved crimes. This is an area with a tremendous number of crimes that haven't been solved, and the vast majority of with, which are believed to be related to gang activity, okay? So again, we're talking about an area with, on the order of 30 street gangs, and, and hundreds, you know, on the order, like say 600 crimes a year in this neighborhood, where say a third of them are unsolved. So hundreds of unsolved crimes, okay? And so, so Sean, came, Sean Malinowski came to us and said, you know, what we really need from you, I mean, we don't think you're gonna solve the crime with your math. I mean, we're re realistic about this, but we think that you might be able to figure out with some high probability, out of these 30 gangs, maybe three of them that are most likely to be responsible for that crime. And if you can narrow it down, that, gives, that might give us enough resources to actually go and figure out what happened, rather than sort of randomly canvassing people. So this was what we were tasked with. We were tasked with the idea of taking, looking at patterns and data, and could we use those patterns to try to come up with you know, three gangs that might have been responsible for an unsolved crime? So how do we do this? What we had to do is we had to start before we got to the hard problem. And so I should say that when Sean brought this problem to us, it was like two years before we had a solution. Okay, just to give you an idea of re academic research, so this is the time scale you're talking about. Because, you, I mean, I can't say, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to stop teaching tomorrow and forget about my classes and start working on this full time. No, right, we have other things we have to do. Students have to be hired, right? Um, programs have to be run. And for this problem, we had to do something first before we could solve unsolved crimes. We had to come up with a model for how those crimes are happening in the first place, right? We have to understand the dynamics first. So let's, um, I have time to do this, I think. So I like to do an experiment with the audience um, and in order to do this experiment, I need two groups. And you're sort of like gangs, okay? <laughs> so, so somehow, but somehow we have to divide you up into two groups. And so I like to pick groups that are sort of natural from how the audience is sort of organized or the types of people who are here. Do you have a suggestion for this? <laughs> no, because I don't know what you would like. Well, I can't tell you the punchline. That's a secret. It doesn't matter, I just need like two, I mean, okay, so because, okay, no, no, okay, yeah, yeah, that'll work, no, that's gonna work, that's gonna work, but I gotta be honest, you got, they got the law enforcement guys on this side, so, you know, so that might, that might change the dynamics a little bit, okay, so, okay, so, um, so I need a volunteer from the first group. Yeah, I thought you might want to. What? No, you, you can sit, you can sit, you can sit. But tell me your name. Tim. Tim, okay, so Tim. Tim is the leader of the, I need, what, what's, what, what, which, which is north and south here? Okay, so Tim's the leader of the south side gang. Okay, and I need, Jill, do you want to be the leader of the north side gang? Yeah. Jill is the leader, I have to pick you because you're the director of the institute. So we have Tim and Jill, the leaders of the North and the South Side gang. And you know, it's winter in Providence and people are like going store crazy at home because it's freezing. And so Tim, you and your gang, you know, you're getting a little bit crazy and you like want to go do something. So one night you sneak over to the South Side Gangs area and you have your, since you're wearing the blue shirt, you got your blue spray paint and you go spraying South Side Gang, all, you know, your South Side Gang stuff all over the buildings down there, up there north, right? Okay, and then you sneak away. Okay, so you wake up, Jill, the next morning and so doesn't everyone else on the North Side and you see this stuff and you're not happy about it. So you have to make a decision. I'm gonna give you two choices. So, you, so your choice one is that you're just above all of this. And so you're gonna turn the other cheek and just set a good example. Um, so choice number two is you go after him. 
and you get back at them. So you need to pick one of those choices. Well, choice two. Okay, so, <laughs> but, 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 okay. So you pick, so she picks choice two. So she's back, so they, so the next night they sneak over to your area and they, and, and they take their spray paint and they spray North Side Gang on your area. And so Tim, what do you do? Well, you could turn the other cheek at this point. Do you want to do that? I mean, it's getting close to Christmas time, you know? Santa Claus and all that, right? You might want to turn that other cheek, right? So let's suppose, let's, let's, let's just do the little thought experiment. Suppose he turns the other cheek. Jill, now it's your turn. What do you do? Well, I don't continue, I also. Oh, man, okay. All right, so you have just described, Jill has just described the decay rate in our model, okay? So now let's talk about the model. So that was a thought experiment to walk you through our model for the, the rate of violence that happens um, in, with regard to gang retaliation activity. So here's what happens is we have, a this is now all statistical, so we have a model for the intensity of our rivalry, but it includes a bunch of terms. So there's some background rate, and this background rate is completely random. It, does, it has nothing to do with historical information. So there's no knowledge in this number. It's just some rate at which, at which events are happening. Um, it's like what we call in, in statistics a Poisson process, and if you don't know what that is, it's okay. It's just like the rate at which people come into a bank you know, throughout a day, that idea. They have, they have no connection to each other. Right, so there's not more, because you go to the bank doesn't mean suddenly your neighbor has to go, right? Okay, so, but as soon as, as soon as something happens, it kicks off this excitation, which means suddenly another event is much more likely to happen. And so there's a rate at which that excitation occurs, and it, and it, and it occurs with a decay rate that depends on the time since the most recent incident. So that's the model. It's called a Hox process. And so it involves basically three parameters, the background rate, the retaliation strength, and either the duration, yeah, basically the duration of the retaliation. And so that's a three parameter Hox process. And this is the model that is central in our predictive policing algorithm, and it's also central in our model for gang crimes. And so you can take field data, and you can fit the model to field data. So here is a time series of gang crimes in, um, with, between two rivals in Hollenbeck, and you're seeing it's pretty tightly clustered in time. And then you can fit those three parameters to the model, and you can, get, um, you can actually measure the rate at which violence is happening throughout these days, and this is, these are days, so this is like three years worth of data. But then once you have the parameters, you can actually simulate. So I mentioned simulated crime. Here's an example of fake um, attacks occurring in time, basically at the same kind of rate of this, this real data, okay? So this work was done by a team of four undergraduates, and it was published in Sciuro, and they actually, analyzed all of the gang rivalry pairs in Hollenbeck. So it was a huge amount of work for them to do, measuring these three parameters for all of the data. And now you might look at this and say, well, wait a minute. I can, for those of you who are more of an expert in statistics, you can say, wait a minute, I could take a random, you know, un, I could take a Poisson arrival process and generate data, and it might look kind of clustered. And you could actually compute numbers from something that wasn't, really a hox process. And so, so we have to deal with that issue. And so one of the ways we deal with that issue is we have metrics for comparing the hox model versus something like the Poisson model on the same data set. So it turns out there's something called the Akaki information criteria that gives you uh, a metric that says whether which one of these two models is better, whether the data really is self-exciting or not. Um, and what you can see from the actual crime data from Hollenbeck is that not all of the rivalries, but a lot a lot of them show up as hawks, which means that there is self-excitation. And we kind of expect that, right, because of this, this fact that if one gang is known to attack another gang, that that is very likely to cause a, a repeat attack. So all we're trying to do is quanti quantify numerically that information, right? Rather than having it be anecdotal, we want to put hard numbers on that. 
So we do. Now comes the real problem of solving the unsolved gang crimes. And this was work done by my student, Alexei Stomakin, who is now famous because the project that he worked on after this one, and I kid you not, this is real, he worked on the snow simulation for the movie Frozen. And they won an Academy Award. So, right, that's another advantage of living in LA. You get to work on real crime, and then you get to work in the movies, right? So, it's a lot of fun. Um, but, before he, but before he worked on the movie, he actually worked on this problem of solving unsolved gang crimes. And so this is kind of a toy picture of the problem that he solved. And so imagine that you have timelines associated with each rivalry pair. So I have, here I have three gangs, the Alpha Gang, the Beta Gang, and the Gamma Gang, and each of them fights with the other gangs. So I have a timeline for each rivalry. So, so on this timeline, Alpha and Beta are fighting each other, and every time there's an event, we put a dot, right? So he, these are known events. But then suddenly there's an event that might be due to this rivalry, but it could be one of these other ones, right? Right, so, so you hear shots fired, and you don't know if it's the north side gang firing at the south side gang, or the west side gang firing at the south side gang. You don't know. But you know that it happened, and it happened at this time. Right? So, so whenever you see the open circles, that's an unsolved crime. And what we're trying to do is fill in that circle. So we have a whole bunch of circles that are unfilled, and they're, and they're simultaneously in time, and you have to pick one. And if you just have three like this, three times, um, you know, this is not such a hard optimization problem of filling, if deciding which um, circle to fill in is the optimal one, and the model that we're using is that we want the solution to be as close as possible to our Hawks model, where we assume, and this is a big assumption, that we know the parameters for the Hawks model on each of these three timelines. Okay, so we want to pick those. But now, imagine that you have the real story, which is like 200 unsolved crimes, and you have 30 gangs, and you have this very complex rivalry network of who where is it? There we go, this one. Of who actually fights with whom. And this is anecdotal too, right? This is all anecdotal. So that now you see the computational complexity. And actually, if, even, if we know, even if we know the model perfectly, um, we still can't just randomly do assignments and hope we get something that works. Because if you have 200, so my point is that you, you don't do this you don't do these separately because if you fill in this dot here, it's going to affect future probabilities for all three timelines, right? So if you decide, if you guys decide that shots fired was North Side Gang attacking West Side Gang, and not the South Side Gang, then suddenly that's going to change the likelihood of the South Side Gang attacking in the future, in the nearby future, because they're not involved, right? But if you don't know who it is, then all of these probabilities for future events are somehow unknown, right? So this is a pretty hard optimization problem because everybody is affecting everyone else. And so what Alexi did, which was really lovely, was to turn this to take this, this combinatorially complex optimization problem and turn it into a variational model, which for the mathematicians in the house, um, suddenly you're, you're, you're changing this assignment problem to one of computing a probability vector for each of these times, and now you're in a continuum space and you can work with variational methods where you vary things continuously. And that turns out to be a big win. Um, there's a lot of technical stuff here, so I'll just say this is really a PhD, UCLA PhD. PhD level problem, but we came up with a very nice model and a very fast algorithm, and here's the result. So it turns out, and the punchline is that if you look at the, the actual Los Angeles data, what it suggests is that using this model, we should be able to get the top three gangs, which is what they wanted, uh, at least to get you know the, 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 the true gang within our top three um, on the order of 80% of the time. Which is pretty good because if you guess based on what you what we already know, you're going to be about 50%, not 80%. So that's a big improvement. Um, this is this being used in the field? No. Why? Because um, this is fairly limited data that we're using, and we believe that additional a lot of additional known data, like the location of the crime and the location of the um, of the gangs and where, they're, where, they're, when, where they've been committing crimes can make this number even better. And so we decided that we wanted to do more work on this before turning this into a field app. 
So that's where we are, but it's a publication. Um, so since I'm actually running over, um, I think I'm gonna stop, but I'll just give you an idea of some of the, the directions we're going in. So this direction involves field interview cards. Um, the, this is actually the first piece of data we've worked with that has personal information, um, and we have to be very careful with that. Um, and we're actually not interested in individuals at all. We're interested, again, in collective behavior. But we're interested, the reason why personal information can be useful is we can see um, members, individual members of individual gangs associating with other gangs. And we can quantify that, and we can look at a, a social network structure involving in this one data set, um, about 34,000 events of groups of people known to, known to be to observed together at certain times and places um, in, a, in parts of Los Angeles. So this is something that's sort of ongoing work with us. We have one paper on this um, using spectral clustering, and that paper points out rather definitively that while some natural groups from the data um, really involved just almost exclusively one gang. This is the white gang. These are the, the uh, thir in this case, 31 gangs, color-coded. These are the groups from our model. But you see that there are other groupings that actually involve people from a number of different gangs. So this goes um, very much against sort of the anecdotal idea that the gangs really are, are d different from each other. They don't associate with each other because apparently they do, and it's in the field data. Um, yeah, we're also looking at things like predicting where new crimes are going to occur based not only on the old crime location, but also on auxiliary data, like, like here's the residential housing density. Um, this is overhead satellite imagery. Um, for Los Angeles, we have this data, but for a place like um, Baghdad, right, and this is the Department of Defense that sponsors some of this, for a place like Baghdad, we may only have this data. So we wanted to be able to use different types of auxiliary data. Um, so these are various things. This is um, a piece of work from a, a visiting student who is a member of the Spanish National Police um, and a Fulbright Fellow who's also, I think he's a unique person in the world. So he's a PhD student in math who's also an active member of a law enforcement agency. Um, and so he's spending the year with us in Los Angeles. And one of the projects that he's working on is designing patrol strategies for Madrid. So this is Madrid, and this is some of his previous work. Um, and we're trying to use some of our, our own complex uh, optimization algorithms uh, to work with Miguel uh, Camacho on this problem. Um, oh yeah, and, and we're having fun with non-crime data too, but that might be of interest to the police. So this is Twitter data from Los Angeles, and we're using um, some automated algorithms. Like This is five, we, we worked, this was a team, of, by the way, this is one of our undergrad projects from last summer. So working with a team of undergraduates and graduate students, implementing topic modeling um, with sparsity, we're able to pull out um, you know, t t linked topics from the Twitter data like this one here, which if you look at the locations of the tweets, they're all from the LA metro stations, and they're all about graffiti and things like that on the metro. So this is just one topic that was pulled out from the data, but we're having kind of fun looking at um, Twitter and other um, other online media um, for similar kinds of ideas, you know, self-exciting patterns, um, how to automatically segment um, interesting information, and how can we use this um, to benefit society. So I think I'm going to stop there and thank lots of funding agencies. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you for doing that brilliant lecture. And uh, you can take a few questions if you have any. If you have questions, I'd like to bring the mic to you. Thank you. Um, hi. Because the uh, because the crime data that you have is all sampled, um, you know, and, and therefore partial. Uh, I mean, some of, the, some of uh, what I've read about predictive policing comes from, um, uh, like, Bernard Harcourt's uh, work about, uh, about it. Uh, his point is that because the, um, because your information is partial, because it's sampled, and because the kind of sampling involved in policing is not uh, neutral, mm -hmm. that you wind, up, you wind up policing more the areas where, uh, where crime has been. 
That's an interesting question. It's not something that we've looked at at all in our group. And to do that, we would need a really good model for the uh, the not the unknown events. And we have we, it's not just not something that we've looked at at all. Um, but on the other hand, what we're trying to do, I mean, we're trying to come up with algorithms that could be used directly in the field and therefore need to be targeted on to the crimes that would be identified by the police anyway. I mean, if, if there, there are events happening that there's no way that they're going to be able to access based on current policing practices, that's, I think that in a way that's sort of outside of what we as mathematicians can do. Now, there may be, on the social science perspective, many other things that can be studied, but in terms of just straight data analysis and one that can be directly used in the field, right? Um, um, we have to work with the crimes that are, are of a certain type. And you're right, there may, be, there may be biases exactly of that nature. But it, it, I also can say that it's certainly by no means the only thing that's going to be used. I, can I give an anecdote? I'd like to mention an anecdotal story that came straight from my colleagues at LAPD about um, events. So this is a, just an example of how they might instantaneously decide to change how they're going to patrol. Um, so one night, or, or, so this was happened one night um, after they had a series, it's one neighborhood where they had a series of automobile thefts. And there was sort of a rash of automobile thefts. And they were getting really annoyed with this. But they didn't have a lot of resources. They didn't have enough people. They had cars, but not enough people to up the patrols. So what they did was they took twice as many cars. And instead of having two guys in one car, they put one guy in one car. And they told them just to drive. They said, don't get out of the car. Just drive around with your lights flashing. <laughs> right? So suddenly, there's twice as many cars driving around the neighborhood with the lights flashing at night. Automobile theft rate went way down, right? Same number of, same number of guys, right? Just more cars. Um, and now, that's not going to work forever, because eventually the criminals are going to kind of get wise and figure out what's going on. But sometimes you just have to think strategically instead of you know, the kinds of things that we're doing. And in fact, we, in, you know, in terms of strategy, we are actually working with a team at USC that works on game theoretic models, right? where you try to do this. You try to do these kinds of crazy things. They're experts on Stackelberg games. Um, it's Malin Tambay's group. They've actually, um, they actually have the software that's used by the checkpoints at LAX at the airport, you know, looking for bombs and things like that. So, so they're, they're thinking about much more strategic types of crimes than crimes of opportunity that we might be thinking of. And I think there are just many, many ways to approach these problems and lots of ways that mathematics can play a role. So that's kind of a bigger answer than what you wanted, but it's, it's sort of my stock answer to questions like that. Another yeah. question? Yeah. How about from, I'm wondering if the law enforcement guys have questions. Yeah, or maybe comments, probably more comments than questions, right? Thank you. Yeah. I was uh, wondering if you were concerned that criminals will stop collecting police reports and get to the police are going to show up. <laughs> yeah, you know, so there's two answers to that. So one is that, so far as we know, no one's broken into the PredPol server. I have an anecdotal story, though, about the, can I tell my anecdotal story about the PredPol server? <laughs> OK, I got to tell the story. So, there, so we're, running, we're running this algorithm in Atlanta. And Martin Short, the one who works with us, now works, he's now a professor at Georgia Tech. That's in Atlanta. So one night, he's out with a bunch of friends for dinner. And he left his backpack in the front seat of the car. What was he thinking? So you know what happened. Car's broken into, backpacks grabbed, the laptop is gone. So, we told, so he told us this. And George Moeller, who's in charge of the PredPol servers, gets online and checks for Atlanta. Where was PredPol predicting the crimes to have occurred that night? Within 100 feet of that location, that program was predicting a crime to have occurred. So Martin really should have been up on what was going to happen, because he wouldn't have lost his backpack, because um, he was one of those events. Um, but um, it, so in reality, there's, so that's an anecdotal story. But in reality, there are two issues. One is, of course, you, wanna, you want to have uh, you know, tight security on the computer servers and also on the information, the intel that's going out to the cops in the field. Definitely need that. But on the, other, on the flip side of things, suppose you're a sophisticated criminal and you develop your own, because you could do this. You could, de you could develop your own server, right? Tim is going to do this. So Tim's going to get your whole gang together. You're going to develop your own server that's going to run this program. So here's the kicker, though, is that their server is using a random number generator 
for a probabilistic model to come up with locations. These are, so, I mean, in reality what happens is the model says, yeah, the crimes have been here, and that gives you a spread as to where the nearby crimes are gonna occur, and then some random number generator picks a location that's kind of random within the spread, but with the right probability. That's exactly what happens. Your random number generator, unless you're like spying on theirs, yours will be different, and so, Eve, so it might be the same location, but you know, Tim, the location you're generating might actually be different because there is a probabilistic component to this. So that's another answer to the question. Another question? Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Why exactly does crime increase, increase after a house has been burglared? House has been broken. I think I should ask these guys, because you, you, you probably know better than I do. I'm not in the field. Um, I used to be a district commander for five years in Providence, and uh, I used something like this, but can't afford the, uh, the software. Right. Uh, obviously, uh, we used a uh, manual crime trend analysis. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this seems to be mostly oriented towards property crime. That's one thing you can do, yeah. And uh, we used a lot of the crime trends of us, B and E's and, and the uh, stolen vehicles. Yep. But what wasn't mentioned was method of operations that the- uh, Yes, uses. yes. Um, and that basically identifies specific people. Yes. Um, and, and that's, in law enforcement, I think that's where we want to go uh, versus the area itself because Instead of displacing the area of the crime, we want to be specific and make the arrest so we could exactly. terminate it. Yep. Um, yep. As far as the question, why would the houses around the houses that get broken into, um, you know, you could go different ways with that. Um, you could go into the community policing method of broken window theory, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. with the window keeps broken. Yep. Um, they see that. Nobody cares about the neighborhood. Right. Um, but then again, it, you could go that now this become uh, like a spree, a, a victimized area. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. in the areas that I I had in province plan is here, Dan Clement, and um, he he identified hot spots, but those are mostly over time. Um, extended time, not real time. Right. Um, so we were concentrated on that, but we knew exactly the areas that will, you know, more likely um, be better off with better patrols. And whenever a house got broken into, um, yes, we would patrol that area because they will come back either to the same house or to the same general. So yep. it's, it's because they know that the, um, it's, it's a neighborhood that really is not well protected or people are not there. Um, criminals look at where would they get the bigger buck for their action. And yeah. um, if they know that an area, everybody goes to work in the morning, they're gonna come back because they're gonna say the neighbor also goes to work. Okay, let's thank Andrea again. That was great. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming.